idealism prevails. Make the world a better place. Good evening and good evening and welcome at the Diplomatic Academy. It's a pleasure to see so many who are interested in tonight's discussion. It's good to have a full house uh, on the issue we have. I always wonder whether there is a problem of getting enough interest people if the US is in the title of a, of a discussion. And it's very good that, that we have the chance uh, tonight uh, to have uh, Professor Rashid Khalidi with us. Uh, to speak about U.S. policy and the question of Jerusalem. Uh, we are the co-organizers of this event. I thank the Bruno Geiske Forum for organizing this, and not only this, but also, as I understand, a conference uh, on some of the issues we raise. Uh, why did we accept to have such a discussion uh, with only American and Palestinians? Um, I would say the, the, the thing that convinced me as a diplomatic director of this academy is that uh, it's 40 years uh, of the first publication of the book by Edward Said, uh, the book on, on Orientalism. And uh, one might have various criticisms also of what Said said and did. But uh, one thing is for sure, this book changed the course of how we look at, uh, not only historically, but also politically, uh, at, the, at the situation in between the Arabs and the Israelis. Uh, and it has a huge influence until nowadays on these discourses. Uh, and tonight's speaker is, is, you might say, the tradition of Edward Said. And, uh, that's possibly the reason why he's Edward Said, Professor of Modern Arab Studies in the Department of History at Columbia University. Uh, I am saying this because the institution you're doing this uh, used to be called the Oriental Academy. Uh, so maybe we could, have, uh, we could have served as a proof of Edward Said's uh, theories. Uh, and uh, I looked a little bit into the history. Uh, it was very obvious that uh, Partly, he was right also about this academy. Partly, this was named uh, Oriental because it was the Orient was seen as something strange, something different. Uh, and the Austrians at that time thought to be the anti-morals, those who can, can make uh, build walls and try to differentiate between Europe uh, and the Orient. Um, I have the feeling that Maria Theresia, when she founded this, was not as strategically and geopolitically thinking, uh, because the, the, the first instructions for this academy was try to understand the Oriental culture, try to understand the Ottoman Empire, and try to learn the language. So the first thing that people uh, used to learn here was uh, Turkish uh, and also Farsi. Uh, so I think uh, it was more an educational institution which uh, by, by uh, the situation that was uh, between, at that time, with the Hafsid monarchy and the, and the Ottoman Empire, why it was called Oriental. But this tells you that Vienna is a good place to discuss uh, these issues. Uh, uh, I'm not going into the story uh, about Jerusalem. I'm not giving you the official EU line now in the introduction because you know it all better. I'm not uh, asking the question uh, why did the President of the United States do what he did at the end of last year. Uh, I am, one thing I want to say, I'm very thankful that the reactions to this in the Palestinian worlds were less radical than many people uh, around the globe thought they would be. Uh, so with all this, I welcome you at the Academy uh, and wish us a very interesting evening. Thank you for coming. Good evening, everybody. And uh, thank you, uh, Director Briggs, for this wonderful cooperation that we um, initiate, reinitiate uh, tonight. We, both of us, reinitiated tonight. I am very happy that so many people have followed our invitation. I'm happy that finally, after 10 years of hunting him, uh, Rashid accepted to come back to Vienna, where he was uh, several times before at the Kreisky Forum. 
I would like you uh, to understand very, very briefly the frame in which we are working uh, uh, with uh, Arab and Jewish uh, intellectuals uh, since the last five years. We are gathering in the Kreisky Forum mostly twice a year under the uh, leadership, of the fantastic leadership of uh, Professor Bashir Bashir from uh, um, Van Leer Institute, senior fellow at the Kreisky Forum and Open uh, uh, University in, uh, in Israel. And uh, uh, many of these people who are working with us are here with us tonight. It's uh, fantastic Jewish and Arab scholars from around the world who are eager to work together on engaging on the other. And uh, the time that, uh, I mean, the, the, since it is two years that this group is working, to, five years that this group is working together, uh, underlines the, the, the seriousness, the humanity, the friendship, and the, the um, academic depth of the thinking of this group of people. I'm very grateful for, to all of you that you are here tonight. Uh, we are starting then tomorrow morning to work together. And I would like to uh, give the floor to Leila Farsak, who is uh, introducing uh, Professor Rashid Khalidi tonight. And uh, we're looking forward to a very interesting evening. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce a very dear friend, a colleague, a very important historian, and a political analyst who has been a prolific writer and a very important contributor in, to our understanding of the Arab-Israeli conflict as well to the question of US policy, not to mention about uh, Palestinian nationalism. Professor, Edwards, uh, professor Rashid Khalidi is a prof Edward Said Professor at Columbia. He graduated from Yale and from Oxford and has written numerous books which have been translated in various languages, uh, including um, the latest broken, Brokers of Deceit, How the U.S. Has Undermined Peace in the Middle East. Uh, many of you might know Resurrecting Empires, Western Front, uh, Footprint and America's Perilous Path in the Middle East. One of the most important ones, in my view, was um, his uh, work on Palestinian national consciousness, uh, national movement, which is the Palestinian identity, the construction of a modern national consciousness. And he has various um, regular political analysis and contribution, which he makes in international newspapers and media outlet that provides, a, in my view, insightful and very deep uh, critical analysis of trying to understand what is the peace process, why it failed, what is the role of the US, and how do we can we move forward, uh, both locally and internationally, to establish and understand uh, the means for peace in the area. So uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Professor Rashid Khalidi. Well, thank you all for this very warm welcome. Um, I'm very flattered that so many people are here um, and that you're not at the Opera Ball tonight. Um, clearly, some of you have your priorities right, um, the ones who are here, obviously. Um, it's a great honor to be a guest of an academy that was founded by the Empress Maria Theresa um, in a city that is at the border between east and west in a certain sense. Uh, Poisson comes from here, for reasons that you all know, I'm sure. Um, it's also a pleasure, again, to be a guest of the Kreisky Forum, um, with which, as Gertrude mentioned, I worked uh, for a number of, uh, I, I came for a number of occasions uh, to Vienna to work with. Um, uh, the Kreisky Forum is named for someone who I think was, uh, as I said to a journalist earlier this evening, not just perceptive in his understanding of both sides, but actually try to do something. And I think that's the lesson that we should take from you know, Kreisky's career and from some of the work that the forum tries to do. It's fine to think and write and talk and analyze. That's important, it's necessary, it's vital. But in the end, it's important to do something. And this is a conflict that actually requires people to do something. So at the end of my talk this evening, I'm gonna suggest some things that the Palestinians can do. Um, but all of you in this room can probably think of some things that Europeans 
for example, I assume many of you are Europeans, can do. Um, the problem was not created in the Middle East. The problem was created in Europe. Zionism is a result of European anti-Semitism. Zionism is a reaction to European anti-Semitism. Zionism is an understandable reaction to all of those things. Our problem was caused by things that happened on this continent in the last century, mainly, but over many centuries. So you helped to cause it. Maybe you should help to do something to solve it. And by that, I don't just mean talking and thinking and writing and analyzing. I mean understanding your role, understanding everyone's role, understanding the actual nature of the conflict, and trying to do something to resolve it. Um, but that's not why I'm here tonight. My topic tonight is the policy of the Trump administration on Palestine, uh, focusing on President Trump's decision to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital and to move the US embassy there. I'm going to begin by talking about the outlines of this administration's foreign policy generally and its Middle East policy in particular before I touch on the question of Palestine and Jerusalem and before I end with some of the strategies that I think the Palestinians should follow to do something to end this problem. Um, I've been following American presidents since I was a small boy. I, I was born in the United States. I grew up in New York City. And so I've been following American policy since President Eisenhower, which tells you how old I am. And I have to say, it is more difficult to discern coherence in the policies of this administration on any major international in issue than it has been insofar as any American administration that I've ever paid any attention to. This is true of policy on Russia, on China, on Korea, on trade, as it is on the Middle East. And I'm going to give you my analysis, which is a, a, based on essentially journalistic readings. But I think this is because this administration features a deep chasm between the radical, erratic, and unconventional inclinations of Trump and his closest political advisors, and on the other hand, the conservative orientation of those who head the major branches of the permanent bureaucracy. Um, leading figures in this group are the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of State, General James Mattis, and Rex Tillerson, the President's Chief of Staff, General Kelly, and his National Security Advisor, General McMaster. As you can tell, three of these men are military officers, former military officers, two of them are former Marines. They're opposed by a set of ideologues, a set of neophytes at foreign policy, including Trump himself, never had any foreign policy experience in his life, his daughter Ivanka, his son-in-law Jared Kushner, and extremist advisors like Stephen Miller, a director of Central Intelligence Mom, Mike Pompeo, and UN Ambassador Nikki Haley. This group includes a combination of fiery neoconservative true believers and cynical political operatives. They either fully share or are willing to stoke the chauvinistic and xenophobic inclinations of the political base that elected Trump president in 2016. Virtually all members of the group, including President Trump himself, have no knowledge of or experience in world affairs. The president has been to Moscow. He has no experience in world affairs. With the exceptions of Pompeo, who is a former congressman from Kansas, and Haley, who is former governor of South Carolina, most took their current posts never having won an election and with only a hazy understanding of the US Constitution or of how the American federal government actually works. By contrast, the other group, secretaries of defense, secretary of state, chief of staff, and so forth, um, are veterans of the military, the security establishment, and other branches of the American deep state, as well as members of the business community. All of them have lifelong experience in international affairs and security issues. They have differences with one another, but they all believe in the traditional doctrines of US foreign policy based on American exceptionalism, interference in the affairs of others, maintaining global supremacy, but with a concern for maintaining the international status quo, preserving traditional American alliances, and avoiding adventurousness and unnecessary armed conflict. So US foreign policy is incoherent because of the contradictions between these two diametrically opposed tendencies. The first 
is driven solely by a short-term interest in feeding the outrage of President Trump's political base with bombastic anti-foreign rhetoric so as to retain the loyalty of this base and help the Republicans win the midterm elections this year and help Trump win re-election in 2020. That is what drives that wing of our government. By contrast, the professionals, the other wing, are concerned with the long-term maintenance of American hegemony over the international system. This apparent schizophrenia is perfectly apparent in the administration's Middle East policy. Thus, virtually the entire foreign policy and security establishment, including key figures who are hostile to Iran, have expressed themselves in favor of the maintenance of the nuclear deal that was negotiated by the Obama administration, the EU, Russia, and China. Meanwhile, the president and his political advisors are completely opposed to the deal, although most of them have to, seem to have only a sketchy understanding of what the deal consists of. The ascendancy of this group was shown by Trump's decertification of the deal against the unanimous advisors, uh, sorry, against the unanimous advice of the permanent bureaucracy. The same kind of ambivalence is on display regarding affairs in the Gulf. While out of concern for the maintenance of US military bases in the Gulf and broader US interests, Trump's cabinet officers favored neutrality in the Saudi-Qatari dispute and argued for restraint of the Saudi-Emirati axis in their campaign against Qatar. Trump has leaned heavily in favor of Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Against the advice of much of the permanent bureaucracy, Trump has also encouraged the aggressive policies towards Qatar, Yemen, and Iran pursued by the Saudi Crown Prince of Hamad bin Salman, Al Saud, and the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi uh, and the Emirates, um, Hamad bin Zayed Al Nahyan. Trump has intervened in personally in Middle East issues against the advice of his senior advisors to a greater extent than any US president that I can think of. Um, this deviation from the norm established by presidents from Roosevelt to Obama is greatest where Palestine and Israel is concerned. Because Israel is more of a domestic issue in American politics than a foreign policy issue, US presidents have always been more directly involved with it than most other foreign policy issues. However, Trump's predecessors, even very pro-Israeli presidents like Truman or Reagan or George W. Bush, were always open to the advice of their senior officials who argued for the long-term regional and global interests of the US where these interests clashed with domestic considerations that favored Israel. This has not been true of Trump so far. He doesn't seem to care about US strategic interests. While ignoring much of traditional US policy on Palestine and Israel, such as lip service uh, to the two-state solution, Trump has taken personal diplomacy on Palestine and Israel to a new level. He appointed two of his personal lawyers, David Friedman and Jason Greenblatt, whose expertise, such as it is, is in bankruptcy and real estate law, respectively, as ambassador to Israel and envoy for Israel-Palestine negotiations. Those negotiations are bankrupt, so perhaps Greenblatt is an appropriate choice. <laughs> Meanwhile, he has put his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, who is a real estate mogul, in charge of supervising the negotiating process. Kushner has also played a major role in contacts with the Saudi government, in particular with the Saudi crown prince. All three, as anyone who reads the papers can tell you, are extreme right-wing Zionists who are long-term financial supporters of the settler movement in Israel, and all are personally extremely close to Trump. Friedman has spoken of a so-called occupation, while Greenblatt has stated that West Bank settlements are not an obstacle to peace. After a year in office, a little more now than a year in office, this administration has recorded no achievements as far as the issue of Palestine is concerned, although Israel has benefited mightily. Despite Trump's repeated statements that he very much wants to make a deal between Israel and Palestine, this may be nothing more than a smokescreen. By generating draft proposals that are so offensively pro-Israel as to be unacceptable under any circumstances to even the most compliant Palestinians, the Trump administration may have another aim in mind. It may be pretending to favor Palestinian-Israeli negotiations while quietly indulging the Netanyahu government's objective of avoiding negotiations 
so as to maintain the dynamic status quo on the ground in Palestine that is entirely favorable to Israel. This status quo consists of the continued expansion of colonization, creeping legal annexation of the occupied territories, and further entrenchment of Israel's absolute security control over the entire territory between the sea and the Jordan River and over the Palestinian population. Netanyahu has now repeated several times that this is the final objective of Israel, complete, total, permanent security control of the entirety of the country between the river and the sea. Imposing this reality on the Palestinians as a permanent solution is, in any case, the preferred outcome of this Israeli government. However, if the Trump administration ever does come out with a formal negotiating initiative, there is every likelihood, based on media reports, that it will be even more favorable towards Israel and even more dismissive of Palestinian objectives than were the highly biased actions of previous administrations. I know because I was an advisor to the Palestinian delegation uh, that negotiated with Israel from 1991 to 93 exactly how biased the administrations of President uh, 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 George H.W. Bush and uh, President Clinton were. Uh, this one is much more biased. In fact, the main public clue to the orientation of US policy under Trump where negotiations are concerned comes from repeated mentions of the outside-in approach. If you don't know what that means, let me tell you. It amounts to the old uh, American tactic, tactic of persuading Arab client states to normalize relations with Israel and accept standard Israeli positions while employing them to put pressure on the Palestinians to make further concessions to Israel. So far, this approach has produced meager results. One of them is an Egyptian effort to win Hamas away uh, from the Qatari-Turkish axis and also from Iran and to bring about an Egyptian-mediated inter-Palestinian recon reconciliation whereby the Palestinian Authority would retake control over the Gaza Strip. It's impossible to say whether this will succeed given the opposition of the Netanyahu government. It's dubious that such a reconciliation would facilitate negotiations given the open reluctance of the Netanyahu government to negotiate. It justifies this reluctance with a string of intentionally impossible preconditions. We call these shurut in Arabic. Impossible preconditions that the PA must meet, the Palestinian Authority must meet before negotiations can begin. In response to news of a possible Palestinian reconciliation, Netanyahu added to these conditions, saying he would not deal with a PA that included Hamas. So far, the Israeli government has deflected any possibility of negotiations, however far-fetched such a possibility has seemed, with a variety of excuses. One of them is the fragility of Netanyahu's coalition, wherein the prime minister is supposedly hostage to its most right-wing elements. Another is to take refuge behind the weakness of Netanyahu's position in light of three ongoing criminal investigations into his conduct. After the president's announcement recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital and the subsequent Palestinian rejection of US mediation, the Israeli government discovered fresh excuses not to negotiate. Moreover, Netanyahu has shown a remarkable ability to appeal to the radical and extremist instincts of President Trump, his advisors, and the Republican Party, especially regarding Iran. This is actually one of Netanyahu's specialties, beating the Iran drum. You may remember his presentation to the General Assembly with the big bomb. Um, Netanyahu's consistent tactic in dealing with US administrations in the past was to ignore Palestine as much as possible while frantically trying to redirect attention to the alleged Iranian threat. This approach always enjoyed a measure of success in Washington, especially on Capitol Hill, given the knee-jerk hostility to Iran of the Democratic and Republican Party leaderships and many policymakers. Netanyahu's task has become easier than before, given the obsession of Trump and those closest to him with Iran and their susceptibility to extreme Israeli, Saudi, Emirati views on this subject. Those obsessed with Iran include James Mattis, who is the Secretary of Defense, who otherwise has tended to try and restrain Trump's more extreme actions. Now, as the Syrian regime stabilized its situation since the summer of 2017 with strong support from Russia, Iran, and Hezbollah, Israeli political leaders proclaimed their determination to deal with the alleged danger to Israel posed by the reinforced position established by Iran and Hezbollah in southern Syria. This is back in late 2017. These warnings coincided with a Saudi effort to weaken Hezbollah in Lebanon 
and Saudi encouragement of Israel to make a similar effort. Simultaneously, the Netanyahu government launched a campaign in Washington to convince the Trump administration to provide a green light for a possible Israeli attack on Lebanon and perhaps Syria. Since the 67 war, Israel has been careful to acquire prior assurances of US support for every planned act of aggression against its neighbors. If the Netanyahu government were indeed contemplating such an, accident, uh, an action, it would follow this precedent. However, it is hard to see why even this administration, in all its recklessness, would approve such a dangerous move. A war involving Israel and Lebanon and possibly Syria has the potential to lead to a much larger regional war in Syria, in Lebanon and Palestine, possibly including Iran, Russia, and the United States. As of now, early February, this eventuality appears to have been shelved, fortunately. This about face was apparently the result of the opposition of the Israeli defense and intelligence establishments. They considered this suicidal and foolish, while Israeli generals and intelligence chiefs resisted the alarmism of Israeli politicians. They also reportedly resented the fact that some Sunni Gulf states seemed to be urging Israel to launch a very risky operation. As a well-connected Israeli commentator put it, Israel despises being asked to perform the role of a stick against Saudi Arabia's Iranian and allied foes. This brings us to the second and even more consequential result of the Trump administration's outside-in approach of bringing the Sunni Arab Gulf monarchies in Israel together in Iran. With the welcome byproduct for both these monarchies in Israel, that such a configuration would lead to a downgrading of the issue of Palestine. This involved encouraging the Saudi and Emirati regimes to bully the Palestinians to accept long-standing Israeli positions that would, in the end, be fatal to the Palestinian cause. This emerged from events around the time of the failed Saudi attempt to force the resignation of Lebanese Prime Minister Saeed Hariri in November 2017 and Trump's announcement of US recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel in December 2017. Both of these radical initiatives were apparently coordinated with Saudi Arabia via the mediation of Jared Kushner with the Crown Prince. With the towering strategic masterminds in the White House behind this strategy, it unites US allies against Iran and worked to the detriment of Palestine, an issue that they saw as an inconvenience to be dealt with summarily in line with Israeli and Saudi preferences. <clears throat> Central to this approach, this entire approach that I've laid out for you of the Trump administration, was President Trump's declaration on Jerusalem. Like virtually all foreign policy actions of this administration, this one was aimed at shoring up Trump's domestic base. It was not based on foreign policy concerns. It was not based on concerns for US interests. Nevertheless, this statement marked a revolutionary departure from 70 years of US policy, going back to the partition resolution uh, of 1947, whereby the status quo of the holy city remained undetermined pending a final resolution of the Palestine question. This step was integrally linked to the ongoing Saudi pressure on the Palestinian Authority to accept the outlines of an American-Israeli proposal for an Israel-Palestine deal. Now, we don't know the exact nature of the deal, but according to every report that I've heard, including reports from people who were uh, involved. This deal would involve a non-contiguous, non-sovereign entity, which would be a state in name only in the Gaza Strip, not including Jerusalem, without removal of his illegal Israeli settlements, and with some areas of the West Bank to be possibly included, subject to further negotiations. This tentative plan, and Trump's Jerusalem Declaration share several features. One is the abandonment of even the previous shabbily transparent American pretense at impartiality as between the two sides. The United States has now taken a side. It has taken the Israeli position on the most important issue in the entire conflict. Another is the explicit or explicit, implicit or explicit American acceptance of a core, a whole set of core Israeli positions. Thus, by recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital, Trump has not only accepted the basic Israeli stand on this vital issue, he has done so without any quid pro quo from Israel and without any recognition 
of similar Palestinian demands for recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Palestine. The latter point is crucial. It means the United States, an ostensible mediator, has accepted a core demand of one side while refusing to even consider the demand of the other party. Equally important, by implication, Trump has also endorsed Israel's expansive definition of a unified, quote unquote, unified Jerusalem, including the extensive Arab areas in and around East Jerusalem that were annexed by Israel after the 1967 war. Now, he's since stated that Jerusalem is off the table, presuming, presumably meaning that there is nothing to negotiate, and the status quo of Israeli annexation of East Jerusalem is a fait accompli. Though his Delphic pronouncements are impossible to decipher, so that may not be what off the table means. But logically, that is what it seems to mean. By these actions, in any case, Trump has ignored decades of US policy. He has ignored over a dozen UN Security Council resolutions. He has ignored the entire body of international law regarding the illegality of Israel's actions in Jerusalem and its annexation and colonization of occupied territory in and around Jerusalem. Equally dangerous, by implication, he is also endorsing Israel's identical actions of colonization and annexation elsewhere in occupied Palestine. This, in my view, is potentially the most revolutionary American policy shift on the Palestine issue since the adoption of UN Security Council Resolution 242 in November 1967. Now, the details reported about the Trump-Netanyahu peace plan, I put the word peace in quotes in my text, share several of these radical features, revolutionary features. Jerusalem, according to this plan, is to belong exclusively to Israel. Settlements and illegal annexations are to be recognized and legalized. Palestinian rights, international law, UN Security Council decisions, world opinion are to be completely ignored. Palestinian interests and concerns are to be strictly subordinated to those of Israel. Now, if any of you have closely observed past American practice where Palestine is concerned, none of this is entirely new. Some of this has been ongoing for quite a while. Um, but with this plan, the United States has ceased to be quote unquote, Israel's lawyer, which is Aaron David Miller's immortal phrase. He said, he was one of the key negotiators, and he said, what we ended up being is Israel's lawyer. Um, it ceased to be Israel's lawyer. Instead, the United States has adopted wholesale the core positions of the most extreme government in Israel's history, and is negotiating directly with the Palestinians on Israel's behalf with the welcome assistance of its Sunni Arab Gulf allies. However, US policy under Trump may develop, the coming stage will probably witness assertion of renewed US sponsored, sponsored custodianship, the word in Arabic is wasaya, over the Palestine issue by the conservative Arab coalition led by Saudi Arabia. This arrangement is not entirely new. What is new is the blatant nature of this effort, the level of open coordination with Israel, and the absence of any effective counterweight to this bloc. Back in the old days, there, were, there was a counterweight to Saudi Arabia in the Arab world. Today, Syria and Iraq are both shattered. They're subject to extensive foreign military and covert intervention. They may not survive as states, uh, and they are entirely absorbed with their own internal problems. The state of fragmentation and civil war in Libya and Yemen is even worse. Qatar is beleaguered. Turkey faces major internal and external challenges. Iran, which has strengthened its regional position in recent years, is primarily concerned with events in Iraq and Syria, and it's grown its own growing domestic, political, and economic problems. Turkey is very busy, as we've seen in Syria. In light of this overall situation, a grim one from a Palestinian perspective, I want to conclude by asking the question, what should be the Palestinian strategy, and how might the Palestinians help us get out of this mess? Some things are obvious to me. Me. As the weaker party in the conflict with Israel, the Palestinian side cannot afford to continue to be divided and must present a united front. This is strategy 101. The weaker party can't be divided in the face of a stronger party. Equally obviously, the basic strategies of both major Palestinian political factions, Fatah and Hamas, have failed, and the Palestinians are consequently without a strategy. 
neither dependence on US mediation in interminable fruitless negotiations, nor a purely nominal strategy of armed resistance have advanced Palestinian aims over the past few decades. In fact, I think they've set the Palestinians back, these failed strategies. This is true however these aims are defined. However you de define Palestinian aims, whether an end to occupation and a halt to colonization of Palestinian land, or the establishment of a Palestinian state, or the return of more than half of the Palestinian people who are now in exile to their homeland, or establishing a democratic sovereign state in all of Palestine with equal rights for all. However you define the Palestinian aims, um, these strategies have not advanced. Before any of these aims can be achieved, whichever one you choose, and before real Palestinian unity can be brought about, a recalibration of Palestinian strategy and a redefinition of Palestinian objectives on the basis of a new national consensus must take place. This is not a job for Europeans. This is not a job for Americans or Israelis. It's a job for Palestinians. There are new realities on the ground, new challenges, new threats, and a new regional and international environment in 2018 that the long bankrupt Oslo approach and that of Hamas and its allies simply do not take into account. It is a searing indictment of the two main Palestinian factions that civil society initiatives like BDS and student activism in Palestine, the US and Europe are advancing the Palestinian cause more than anything either of them is doing. If these two factions, however, can affect a reconciliation, it will at least repair some of the damage that was caused by the split both of them have perpetuated. But nominal Palestinian reconciliation between two ideologically bankrupt political factions, important though it is, will not provide the dynamic new strategy that's needed in order to advance the Palestinian cause and help us towards a peaceful resolution of this conflict. One of the key changes that is necessary is for Palestinian political discourse to appreciate that the dip diplomatic strategy followed by the PLO since the 1980s was fatally flawed and to draw the necessary conclusions. This is not to say any diplomatic strategy would be flawed. This one was flawed. The US is not and cannot be a mediator, a broker, or a neutral party. The US is and has long been staunchly opposed to Palestinian national aspirations. The United States has been formally committed by a secret understanding, it's not secret anymore, but it was originally, that dates back to 1975 that was brokered by Henry Kissinger to support the positions on Palestine that are taken by Israeli government. The United States cannot go beyond the position of Israel on the Palestine question by a letter from President Ford to Prime Minister Rabin in 1975. And that is still binding on the United States. The US will continue with this approach until the Palestinian national movement realizes the true nature of the situation and undertakes grassroots political and informational work inside the United States. This task will not necessarily take generations. Major shifts are already taking place in key sectors of US public opinion. I'll come back to them in a minute. Among the younger generation, among minorities, among Arab and Muslim Americans, and within a considerable segment of the American Jewish community. There is a great deal to build on if a serious effort is made to advance the Palestine cause in the United States. Unfortunately, for a long time, the Palestinian leadership, this one and previous ones, have had no understanding of how American society and politics function or of how to affect them, and they have made no serious efforts to do so. Their ignorance of the complex nature of the American political system has prevented serious, sustained efforts to affect US public opinion or to link up with potentially sympathetic elements of US civil society. By contrast, in spite of the dominant position Israel and its supporters enjoy in the United States, they continue to expend resources lavishly to advance their cause further in the American public arena. Although the effort to oppose them is composed of initiatives by ordinary people, not well-funded, not strongly supported, it has achieved some remarkable successes. This effort has won the initiative in spheres like the arts, notably cinema and theater, the legal arena, where defenders of free speech and the First Amendment to the US Constitution are vital allies, uh, sectors of academia, some major unions and churches, and key parts of the base of the Democratic Party. Thus, notwithstanding the pro-Israel position of the establishment leaderships of both the Democratic and Republican Party parties, American public opinion is beginning to shift away from uncritical support for Israel, 
while simultaneously Americans are becoming increasingly sympathetic to the cause of Palestinian freedom. Now, I'm not just asserting these things. I'm going to read some numbers to, to show you why I'm saying what I'm saying. A poll released by the Brookings Institution in December 26, 2016 showed that 60% of Democrats and 46% of all Americans support sanctions against Israel over its construction of illegal settlements in the West Bank. 60% of Democrats, 46% of all Americans. Most Democrats, 55%, according to the same poll, believe that Israel has too much influence on US politics and policies and is a strategic burden to the United States. 55% of Democrats, that's the majority party. The Democratic candidate got 3 million more votes than Trump in the last election. A 2016 Pew Research poll shows that the percentage of people born after 1980 and of, Democrats who are, and of Democrats who are sympathetic to the Palestinians is growing in relation to those who sympathize with Israel. There's a curve with younger people and a curve with Democrats. The most recent poll by the Pew uh, uh, Research Center, which was released last month in January 2018, is even more striking. It shows that Democrats are almost as inclined to support Palestinians as they are to support Israel. This is unprecedented. It was a Democratic president who brought about the partition resolution and recognized Israel. And the Democratic Party is moving in exactly the opposite direction today. While twice as many liberal Democrats support, sympathize more with the Palestinians than the Israelis. There are, I could cite figures until tomorrow morning that show these trends on a, in a variety of areas in the American public. These figures are unprecedented. Israel still has powerful support in American public opinion without much more work, especially in the Republican Party, and I can talk about that if there are questions. Without much more work, it would be impossible to have a sustained impact on these sectors or on the American political and media arenas, which are only beginning to witness similar shifts. So that's one area that the Palestinians have to focus on, the United States. Efforts to advance the Palestinian cause will require similar work directed at India, China, and non-aligned states. Israel has made great progress in recent years in cultivating these countries. In its heyday, Palestinian diplomacy was very effective in the non-aligned world, and although times have changed, it's possible to be similarly effective there today. In addition, although most Arab states are controlled by undemocratic regimes, most of which are subservient to the United States, and most of which are pathetically desirous of Israeli approval, a majority of Arab public opinion, a majority of the people, not the rulers, the people, are still acutely sensitive to the appeal of Palestine. In 2016, 75% of respondents in 12 Arab countries considered, considered the Palestine cause one of concern to all Arabs. And 86% disapproved of Arab recognition of Israel, not in principle, but because of Israel's oppression of the Palestinians. The PLO should resurrect its former strategy of appealing over the heads of unresponsive, undemocratic, regimes to sympathetic Arab public opinion, as it used to do in the past. One of the most important recommendations for future Palestinian strategy, finally, is to reject wholesale the current failed diplomatic approach and to insist on an entirely different basis for any future negotiations and to engage in intensive global public, public relations and a diplomatic campaign to this end. This is not to say don't negotiate. It said don't, it's to say don't negotiate on the bases on which negotiations have taken place thus far. This new basis must include complete abandonment of the Oslo interim formula. In essence, Oslo was no more than Menachem Begin's 1978 Camp David autonomy plan in a repackaged form. We now have research that's shown exactly how Begin's ideas were transmuted via Shamir and later Rabin into uh, the plan that Israel put forward and that was ultimately accepted uh, as the Palestinian Authority. Begin expressly designed this plan to prevent Palestinian sovereignty and to amplify Israeli colonization, annexation, and control, all of which it has successfully done. This was not a peace plan. This was a colonization plan. This was a plan for continued control. This is a plan to enable annexation, and that is what it has done. The basis for any new negotiations must include a demand for international sponsorship and a rejection of US sponsorship. Instead, 
the Palestinians ought to demand that the United States be present at any negotiation. Obviously, it's the superpower. But as an extension of Israel for the purpose of negotiations. Thus, an American delegation should, of course, be present at any talks, but as an adversarial party sitting with Israel on the opposite side of the table rather than in the middle. This new basis should include, as well, reopening of all of the issues created by the 1948 war that were closed in Israel's favor in 1967 by UN Security Council Resolution 242. The partition boundaries of 1947, the idea of a corpus separatum or internationalization of Jerusalem, the return of refugees, UN General Assembly Resolution 194, the political, national, and civil rights of Palestinians inside Israel, many other ideas, many other issues that were alive from 1948 until 1967, and they have been buried ever since uh, UN Security Council Resolution 242. Any negotiations should be based on the Hague and Fourth Geneva Conventions and on all relevant UN Security Council and General Assembly resolutions, not just those resolutions cherry-picked by the United States to favor Israel. Needless to say, in the current configuration, neither the Trump administration nor the Netanyahu government would accept such terms. And therefore, for the moment, these would constitute impossible preconditions for negotiations. That is precisely the point. They are meant to move the goalposts, since the current goalposts, the current basis for negotiations, was explicitly devised by the United States to favor Israel. It can only lead to further entrenchment of a dynamic status quo that is leading to the complete destruction of Palestine. That is what is ongoing. There is no peace process. There is a process of the degradation of what is left of Palestine in the interest of its englobement in the greater land of Israel. That is what is happening. And that's what this negotiation process is, is designed to further. If the terms that I've suggested are made the basis of a serious and sustained Palestinian diplomatic and public relations campaign directed at establishing a just peace, most countries in the world would probably at least consider them and might be willing to challenge the destructive half-century US monopoly on peacemaking that has prevented peace in Palestine. Now, obviously, even if they were accepted by the entire international community, these terms would not lead to negotiations until major changes take place in Palestine, in Palestinian politics, along the lines I've talked about, unless major changes take place in the international and Arab balance of forces, and unless major changes take place inside the United States and Israel. What is necessary now, as a, as a Palestinian, I can say, is to develop a new Palestinian approach to harnessing the energy of Palestinians, both in exile and inside Palestine as well as sympathizers in the Arab world, the Islamic world, the non-aligned world, and the creation of allies within the societies of the West, who ultimately are desirous of peace and can be made to understand that the current course leads to conflict rather than peace. This is a long-term process. It needs allies. It need, needs help. But it has to be ultimately the, the job of the Palestinians, the Palestinian people whose resistance to colonialism has always involved an uphill battle for a century now should not expect quick results. They won't get them. They have, however, shown patience, perseverance, and steadfastness in defending their rights, which is the main reason that the Palestine cause is still alive 100 years after the Balfour Declaration. It's time for the Palestinian leadership, and it's time for others who support the idea of a just peace to adopt the kind of long-term approach that I've laid out, which alone is capable of achieving both the liberation that the Palestinian people deserve from the servitude that they are under today and peace in the Middle East. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, brilliant uh, lecture, which covered lots of ground um, in, in, in a very uh, inspiring and thought-provoking way, which I'm sure the audience would have lots of 
question to ask. In particular, I loved how you tried to situate uh, the Trump administration policy within the history of U.S. involvement in U.S. foreign policy, but also how to bring it within the region again and to see how the Israel-Palestine U.S. policy towards Israel-Palestine needs to be understood within the regional configuration of how do we, how the U.S. is dealing with Saudi Arabia, how the U.S. is thinking of Iran, how is the U.S. thinking of its long-term strategic interest and the conflict within the own administration over these strategic interests. I think that was very valuable. And finishing with what the Palestinians need to do and how to rethink negotiation and how to on what basis to have, what, what have we learned over the past 25 years, and it's not a coincidence, so maybe it is, that we are in Vienna, and this is also 25 years of the Oslo peace process, and I think it merits a thinking after a quarter of a century, is this worth pursuing, or do we need something else? And I think it's very clear that something else is needed, the question, how do we achieve it? So it would be very interesting to hear what Europe has to say, and it was, um, what you, you can contribute, because if you were also to think about the different um, trajectories that have been uh, mo taken over the past 25 years, especially with regards to the question of Palestine, you highlighted in your lecture how much the, the U.S. there has been incredible growing support for the Palestinian cause that 25 years ago was impossible in the United States. And today, we, it, it, seems that it seems to be much easier to talk about Palestine than it is to talk about Palestine and Israel in Vienna or in Paris or in Germany. And I think this is an important point that highlights how much Europe is important because Europe has been the big supporters of the Palestinian cause because it's an issue of justice, not that because they are Palestinian. Uh, and a question of strategic interest of, the, of Europe in general. And Kreisky, as you said, was one of the most important peace persons who fostered precisely dialogue, fostered precisely engagement on two sides, involved early Israeli-Palestinian negotiation on a very important channels and, and ways. And, but today, things have changed, and one needs to ask if the U.S. indeed uh, can no longer be an honest broker, as you presented, and the U.S. strategically internationally is going through a phase which many predict is the decline of the U.S. empire, and you highlighted how much it's important for now to talk with China, consider China and Iran and uh, India, among others. The question becomes, what can be done in Europe, and why should Europe have a role, um, and what kind of role? So um, that was very illuminating, I think. I think I imagine lots of people have questions that would like to ask. I have lots of questions, but I will, I will not ask them. I'll let the others ask, because we have half an hour, and I'd like to make, take as many questions from the audience. So whoever would like to make a question, I just will ask you to, add, to have a question, not a comment, and to make it brief, please. Yes, is it, here's a microphone. microphone. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to be very quick. Uh, I'm a former US Embassy staff. Uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, you have been very critical of President Trump's uh, policy. What I've been, what I was hearing from uh, Democrats, contrary to the Republicans. And uh, you said that uh, President Trump, uh, key issues on this particular have really side effects. And my, my question is that while the the referendum in 2016 in the United States, 45% uh, of the Americans voted against uh, recognizing Jerusalem as the center for Israel. And the 60% of the uh, Republicans were also against this decision. Then historically, all the, the, the last few presidents like President Clinton, President George W. Bush, and then President Obama and also President Donald Trump used this, uh, recognizing Jerusalem as this, the capital of Israel. And if, if that is, if Americans were against this, then why they are, why they've used this as their tool? And uh, what are the side effects of the global efforts on peace, security, and safety? Uh, after this uh, decision is basically on implementation. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Claudia Kuledi. I'm a student at the Austrian International Institute of Policy. 
Um, my question goes more to the fact that you mentioned that you are heading an Arabic institute. And I perceive uh, Palestine as a divided nation. So it would be of utmost importance to bring together the two different parties. And my question to you there is uh, whether you have some kind of suggestion of which uh, philosophical issues should be taken into a state's policy, which would uh, be apt to, to uh, somehow create a common spirit in Palestine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Maybe one more. Good evening, Professor Khaldi. It's a pleasure to hear you speak. My question is fairly straightforward, actually. Um, having been involved directly in the Madrid peace process, where the governing dynamics of the process was the land for peace equation, UN Resolution 242, um, how do you compare the evolution of the peace process? I'd like to zoom out of the Trump circus and the Jerusalem issue and just I'd like you to give us your insight as someone who was directly involved in the negotiations uh, on the feasibility of actually going back to the Madrid equation and the reason I raised this is because the Madrid delegation which you were part of represented a different sort of leadership it was the inside leadership and it was done with the backing of Palestinian public opinion whereas Oslo was done behind closed doors in complete isolation. Uh, it stooped down to the level of technicalities and I, in my opinion, and I think you seem to agree, that this dragged us down into all sorts of um, dead ends. So I'd like you basically to speak a little bit about the Madrid peace process and the equation that governed that and perhaps you can see, you know, advise if this is a possible solution mm -hmm. of some sort. Thank you. Let me take those three. Um, very quickly, let me answer the first and the second questions, and then I'll focus on the third. Um, you're actually right. Uh, the polling in the United States since the president took his decision on Jerusalem shows that majorities of both parties were not in favor of uh, this move. Um, and so really the question is, why did the president do it? And you really have to look at the makeup of the Republican Party and the base, the core voters for Trump and the core voters for the Republican Party, particularly in the South and the West. There's a very large Christian evangelical uh, element to the voting bloc that is the core of the president's support and is the core of the Republican Party's support. And these people are more pro-Israel than Israel. I mean, they are very, very, very extreme in every position. And so they, the Israeli government was not pushing for this. This was not an APAC measure. This was not a Netanyahu measure. The Israelis were happy to have it, but they were not the motive force. This was driven by the president's calculation and his advisor's calculation that this would be good for Trump and the Republicans in 2018 and 2020. Uh, even though you're right, a majority of Republicans, a small majority, and a large majority of Democrats were against. Um, as far as your question about Palestine, uh, Claudia, um, well, Palestinians are divided. They've been divided uh, ever since the establishment of Hamas in 1987. Before that, the PLO had succeeded for more than two decades in unifying them. And that was not coincidentally the period of greatest Palestinian successes. Um, I think both of this, these two sides have really come to the end of the paths that they, that they followed. Hamas does not really support resistance anymore. Hamas is policing the Gaza Strip on behalf of Israel just as the PA is policing the West Bank on behalf of Israel in order that Israel is not troubled. And it, Hamas does it at, by, because Israel coerces it, and the PA does it out of an agreement, but the end result is the same. <clears throat> so I think both have to accept that they have, they have failed. Now to get politicians to accept that they've failed, that they've ever done anything wrong is almost impossible. <laughs> but public opinion is very, very, uh, if there were a free election and people were able to vote, and they had an alternative, I believe both of these parties would be defeated. I think none of the above would win in a Palestinian election, which is one reason we're not probably gonna have elections. They're terrified of facing their voters. Perhaps Fatah would lose in the West Bank where they've ruled, and God, Hamas would very likely lose in the Gaza Strip. So I think, I mean, I, I, it was a central point in what I said, is that the Palestinians have to achieve a measure of unity before anything can happen. So I, I agree with you. I'm not sure how to do it. If I knew how to do it, I would be a politician. 
I'm just an academic. Um, let me go back to the question about Madrid. I want to say a few things about that. Um, <clears throat> Madrid was about land for peace. If you go back and look at the letter of invitation that Secretary Baker and the Soviet Union, but is really Secretary Baker, sent to all the parties, and you look at the letters of assurances that were sent to Israel, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and the Palestinians. Everybody except the Palestinians was supposed to be negotiating land for peace. The Palestinians were only allowed to negotiate interim self-government arrangements. No land, no peace. You could not negotiate for peace at Madrid or in Washington because of the ground rules. The ground rules were laid down because the United States is forbidden by the 1975 agreement, the letter between, from President Ford to Rabin, from going beyond the Israeli position. And the Israeli position was Camp David, autonomy. So that's all we were allowed to negotiate. We tried to get around this. The head of our delegation was one of the most uh, sophisticated diplomats I've ever met, even though he'd never been involved in formal diplomacy, Dr. Haider Abdushafi. Uh, the, the senior advisor, Faisal Husseini, uh, Hanan Ashrawi, these were extraordinarily competent people. They were chosen by the PLO, by the way. They, were not, they didn't choose themselves. They were not the West Bank leadership that became the delegation. They were picked by the PLO, vetted by the Americans, and grudgingly allowed to go by Shamir. Um, but the, the, the basis on which Syria and Israel, Lebanon and Israel, Jordan and Israel negotiated was fundamentally different than the basis on which we and the Israelis negotiated. We were only allowed to discuss interim self-government arrangements. Jerusalem, refugees, land, sovereignty, statehood, water, settlements, and the occupation. Final status issues. Those will be negotiated after several years of autonomy in final status negotiations. 25 years later, there have not yet been final status negotiations. So there has been no discussion of land or peace. Instead, what was imposed later on, as we all know, in Oslo, behind, as you say, closed doors, without any the, 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 the light of public diplomacy, was a deal that essentially Menachem Begin could have written. And in fact, one of my students has come up on documents in the Israeli archives and the American archives, which show that the Israeli position essentially goes back to Begin's ideas. So. Um, I don't think, I, I think that if we had a Secretary Baker, rather than the undistinguished personalities who've graced the post of Secretary of State, by and large, since that time, if we had a Secretary Baker who was supported by a president who knew a little bit about the world, I mean, we had a president who'd been shot down in World War II, who'd been head of the Central Intelligence Agency, who'd been ambassador to China, who had been in Congress. I mean, he was a person who actually knew something about the world. He had been shot down in World War II in the Pacific. We have today a president who, you know, I mean, he's been to casinos in Macau. That's his ex international experience. Uh, 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 there have been presidents of the United States, President Kennedy, President uh, uh, Eisenhower, who actually have been in the world. And they were generally much better presidents. Um, and so we had a president who knew something about the world uh, and who understood the moment that he was in, which was the end of the Cold War. And we had a Secretary of State who was probably one of the most adept persons I have ever studied in the use of power. He really understood, and I saw this at Madrid firsthand. We saw it in the very short period that Baker was involved in the process. Baker had to leave the State Department to run President Bush's failing second term presidential campaign after about eight or nine months. And so we lost the only person who might have guided this thing to a better end. Uh, than, it, than, it, than it resulted in. But the basic problem was the framework, and the framework was imposed by Israel, and neither Bush nor Baker was able to go beyond that. Uh, if, we're stuck in, if we're stuck in interim, we'll stay in colonization, annexation, and destruction of Palestine forever. There has to be a resolution. This has to be ended. Occupation has to end. Colonization has to end. All of this has to be reversed. Or we have to have a completely different basis. One state for everybody with democratic, something else. Uh, this, this path leads only to this status quo. It was meant to, it can only lead to this. Uh, good evening. 
My name is Nadia Aruri. Um, I have a question and a request. Um, as a Palestinian, having lived here now for 12 years, um, I, I feel maybe, or my, I will start with the request, you touched upon BDS in the United States. Mm -hmm. I see BDS not flourishing in Europe as it is in the States. Um, my observation, probably due to the connotation or the associations it calls consciously or unconsciously with the National Socialism, Holocaust, and boycotting of Jews. Nonetheless, I would like to request maybe for you to speak about the importance of BDS as a nonviolent tool, mm -hmm. as a form of important action here in Europe. Mm -hmm. Now to my question. Um, and to that, taking into consideration that my father was with you in Madrid and Washington, um, amongst us Palestinian youth, activists, people working on the ground, I hear more and more um, sh shunning away from nationalism. Us as youth thinking, when, sorry for my French now, but when the hell are we going to stop trying to go for nationalism, although we can see it as global citizens, as a failing structure, even within Europe. Um, <laughs> when are we going to stop that card, which is actually a reactionary to Israel? Uh, and when are we going to take the initiative and actually be the ones placing new cards and saying, OK, you know what? We don't want nationalism. We want human rights for everybody, for example. Um, mm -hmm. I would like your take on that. If, mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Take Maybe one, one more. That's a big question. Okay, this, this person there and then me. Sorry, and then me. This lady has a mic here. Sir. Saudi, Saudi Arabia is cooperating uh, quite freely and openly with uh, Israel. The reason for that is no, that is Iran. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, it is a weak point for the Saudi Arabian policy because uh, Palestinians and other Arabs would expect that Saudi Arabia would stronger cooperate with Palestinians. Mm -hmm. Naturally, they pay them some money to, to keep them quiet. But nevertheless, I think that in this uh, Saudi position, there's a fundamental flaw. If the Palestinians or other uh, Arabs would say that Saudi Arabia is a traitor to the Palestinian cause, Saudi Arabia would have probably some difficulties. What do you think of this Saudi Arabia position? Mm -hmm. I wanted to present a possibly more optimistic vision for the future. Mm -hmm. uh, 2017 saw the 100th anniversary of the Balfour Declaration, the 70th anniversary of the 1947 independence or Nakba. 1967 saw the 50th anniversary of the occupation. But since then, while well, Palestine shrunk from 100% to 78% to 22% in those 50 years, in the latter 50 years, we have remained at 22% with the whole world, including Israel, including the United States, sticking to the formula of two states peacefully coexisting side by side. Now, Trump's policy may change that formula, and we need to be very, very clear. But the real loss has been Israel's loss over the narrative, Israel's loss over the guilt of American and European jury to criticize Israeli policy. It has lost the ability to conflate criticism of Israeli policy with anti-Semitism, which is a horrible and very real phenomenon, but that has nothing to do with those who legitimately and objectively criticize Israel and want Israeli interests, Palestinian interests, world interests to recognize and fulfill the self-determination of both peoples equally and humanely. Mm -hmm. So if you can comment on those hopefully more mm -hmm. optimistic aspirations. Mm -hmm. Okay, three very, very good and very hard questions. Um, let me start with the first question um, about boycott, divestment, and sanctions by Nadia Aruri. Uh, whose father was with us in Madrid and in Washington, actually. He's a member of the delegation. Um, BDS has uh, uh, become, in the United States, uh, a remarkably successful phenomenon. And the proof of this is the tens of millions of dollars that are being spent, legally and otherwise, to try and stop it. 
Um, there are battalions of lawyers operating in dozens of US states trying to pass outrageously anti-First Amendment laws. One of them was just struck down in Kansas. They will not pass. I mean, these laws can pass, and they will be struck down one after another after another. They're spending money like it's going out of business to try and stop BDS in the United States. And it's, it's completely futile. Uh, on college campuses, uh, among churches, unions, among ordinary people, the base of the Democratic Party. I read you numbers. And the numbers are actually even more striking if you drill down and look at generations and look at regions and look at minorities. If you look at the Jewish community, um, the, the change is astonishing. I have been teaching for over 40 years. I've been back in the United States since the 1980s. I have never seen anything like this in my entire professional life. What is happening, in and this is not just BDS, it's student activism of various signs, but the, the key element in it is BDS. But you've asked a very good question. Uh, which is why does this have a different valence in Europe? Uh, in the United States, the valence of boycott is the Montgomery bus boycott. It's civil rights. It's Mandela and South Africa. It's Captain Boycott. You know who Captain Boycott was? Captain Boycott was a British land agent who oppressed Irish peasants and was boycotted. You say boycott to an Irish American and he says, yes, boycott, <laughs> because it means standing up against injustice. In fact, the judge who heard the case against the Students for Justice in Palestine branch at Fordham University, who was an Irish American, when she was told by the lawyer for Fordham University, well, boycott is a bad thing. And then the lawyer for the students said, yes, but South Africa and the Montgomery bus boycott. And she said, and boycott in Ireland. <laughs> so in the United States, boycott is a good thing. Boycott is something that the American Jewish community did against Germany during the Nazi era. So in the United States, it has a positive valence. You're right, in Europe, it's a different issue because Europe has a cloud of guilt, justified guilt, guilt for a reason, okay? This is not manufactured guilt. It's not somebody making people feel guilty. They feel guilty because they should feel guilty, not because anything they did, because of the history of their society. There's nobody of this generation. It's something that, though, is true historically of Europe. The problem is, Europe expiates its guilt by helping to create a, another problem, okay? It created a problem, the problem of anti-Semitism. Modern anti-Semitism is a European phenomenon. It's been exported to the Arab world. You have fanatics in the Arab world using tropes that were produced in English or French or German 100 years ago. So we have a, a problem which, whose origins are European. And so Europeans naturally, unfortunately, react in this, in this fashion. Um, I have no prescriptions for Europe. I don't live in Europe. I'm not a European. <laughs> I'm based in the United States. I spent time in the Arab world. I spent some time in Europe, but I, I'm not inside these societies. And I understand in France, where I spend a lot of time, it's a huge struggle. In England, it's an enormous struggle. There are powerful forces that are trying to conflate exactly, uh, as, as you said, anti-Semitism. Sorry, as you said, anti-Semitism uh, with uh, criticism of Israel. Uh, the ironic thing, uh, we are being criticized. I'm the head of, uh, I was one of the heads of a, a center for Palestine studies, which we founded at Columbia University. We were accused of being anti-Israel. I went back over the seven, eight years. Half the speakers we brought are Israeli. Half the speakers we've invited are Israelis, Israeli Americans. Some of them are Arab Israelis, some of them are Jewish Israelis, but they're Israelis. How can we be anti-Israel if half of our speakers are Israeli? What it means is we're against a certain trend, or the speakers we've brought have been critical of a certain trend of Israeli policy. They're not anti-Israel, they're not against themselves. So um, I think this is, a, this is a discursive problem, which I, it, I agree, it's a, it's a, it's in, in Europe it's a much, much more difficult problem because of the legacy that Europe unfortunately bears going back hundreds and hundreds of years. Jews were expelled from France, Jews were expelled from England. If you're English or French, you bear a historic weight. I mean, the entire Jewish community was expelled from some of these countries. You all know this better than I do, or if you don't know it, you should know it. Uh, this is not an American problem. This is a European problem. It's not an Arab or an Israeli problem. It's a European problem. Um, as far as your question about Saudi Arabia, I mean, I, I, I suggested some of what you said, actually. Um, I would say one thing about this. This is the most autocratic government in the world. This is not a democratic regime, nor Saudi Arabia, nor the Emirates, nor Bahrain. In Kuwait, they have democracy. 
but in all the other countries of the uh, GCC, you have autocratic governments, which are in no way representative of their people. Read the deep history of Saudi Arabia, and you'll find that uh, from King Faisal onwards, there has been an attempt to prevent unions, political parties, a free press, all of it in the name of Islam, which was a, the tool that was used to suppress freedom in Saudi Arabia. But there was a powerful movement within Saudi society for decades uh, to try and open up that society. In fact, King Saud, who's vilified, uh, was, was, was the one who was in some ways sympathetic to this uh, approach. Uh, this, this current regime in Saudi Arabia is restoring the most absolute form of monarchy under the, form of, under the, name, under the label, the false label of reform. It's allowing certain forms of social reform, which are, of course are welcome, and it's trying to reform the economy for whatever, to whatever end that ends up uh, leading. But the most important thing is it's centralizing political power in the hand of a family, which has not just run the country, but owns the country since it was founded. It's the only country in the world which is the personal property of the ruling family. Think about that for a minute. L'état c'est moi is actually true in Saudi Arabia, much more than it was true of Louis XIV. Much, much, much more. Much more than it was true of King John before the barons forced him to sign Magna Carta. The degree to which the state is not just run exclusively by a few members of the royal family, but owned by the royal family is astonishing. And Saudi Arabia uh, doesn't just bribe people in the Middle East. It bribes people everywhere. We have a center established in a major East Coast Ivy League university, which has received $20 million from Saudi Arabia. Another major university in Washington, DC, received $20 million from Saudi Arabia. Another major element of the University of California system on the West Coast received $20 million from Saudi Arabia to set up centers where people do what they do, Princeton. I could go on and on and on. Harvard, Berkeley, Georgetown, uh, Leiden here in, the, in Europe. I, there's a half dozen universities. They, they give much less in Europe. They don't need to spend quite as much in Europe. It's less expensive, Europe. Um, but that buys the silence of the, of the intellectuals. That shuts them up. You don't have uh, people willing to say extremism in the Middle East is largely a result of Wahhabi ideology. Takfiri jihadi ideology is rooted in Wahhabism. Hatred of Shia is not a common phenomenon in Islam. It is a phenomenon exclusively in the modern era rooted in Wahhabism. It is a Saudi product. The blowing up of Shia in Pakistan is a Saudi product. The blowing up of Shia in uh, Iraq is a Saudi product. It's not that the Saudi Arabian government is financing the people who do it. The ideologies that they have spread since King Faisal came to power in 1962 are at the root of these ideas. Takfiri jihadi ideology is an outgrowth of the ideology that's had you. You do not dare say that in Washington, DC. Trust me. You don't dare say that in most American, well, you can say it in American universities, but the big professors who are in the big centers are very unlikely to say those kinds of things. So it's not just a problem for the Palestinians or the Arabs. It's a problem for you and for us, all of us. A last question about optimism. I, I thought my talk was very optimistic. <laughs> Um, I laid out a new strategy. I mean, I don't think anybody's going to necessarily listen to me, but it, I mean, it's a strategy. And I, uh, I talked about fundamental, profound changes in the United States. And you're absolutely right. Discursively, they've lost. The arguments that, an, uh, and they've lost particularly with younger people. Younger people don't pay attention to the mainstream media. They don't believe what their elders tell them. They're independent in their thinking. They travel much more. The number of people with passports in the United States has gone up from under 40% to over 60%. What does that mean? It's mainly young people. They're going around, they're seeing the world. They don't just read the New York Times and listen to CNN, okay? They have innumerable sources of information, some of them awful sources. But the result is the kinds of shifts that we're seeing in the Democratic Party, which is the, the party that's much more representative of the young. That's the future. So if you want to be optimistic, look at not the big donors to the Democratic Party, the Haim Sabans and all those people. Don't look at the Clintons. Don't look at the, the, the party machine, which, is, which bows down every time APEC you know, just points its finger. Look at the base of the party. Look at the young people. Look at the Jewish community. I mean, discussion of Israel in a lot of synagogues in the United States is a, is a difficult, fraught problem. It was, a, it was something nobody disagreed about 30, 40 years ago. 
Today, there are arguments about it all the time. I, I, I attend seders. People argue. I mean, imagine. Imagine this. So the, the, there, there are very positive shifts on college campuses in academia. Uh, many, many academic bodies in the United States have taken steps in, in the direction of some kind of supportive action uh, towards, uh, uh, as far as Palestine is concerned. Uh, I, could, I could talk about churches, I could talk about unions, I could talk about many other areas in which there is positive, there's, the trends are, are positive. Um, the resistance is very great, obviously. And the important areas of pol political decision making have not yet been really affected. Um, but I think that the trend is very positive. I, I was very optimistic. So I have two more questions, and this is going to be the last one. But actually, three, the last other question. But before you take them, you need to answer Aruri's point about Which one? nationalism. Ah. The youth and nationalism. And, and yeah. You were posing a question about the Palestinian. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not going to leave you off the hook on that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm a, I'm a. I'm, a, uh, I'm agnostic on the question of nationalism. I think that, I think that um, nationalism is usually based on uh, ideas that are largely false. Um, there are wonderful theorists who can put it much better than I. The idea of an imagined community, uh, the idea of invented tradition, a number of very good ways of understanding how you take things that are true and turn them into something that's really untrue. Every national movement does this. I could give you France. Jeanne d'Arc. Jeanne d'Arc was not fighting the English. The French and the British rulers spoke French. There was no English-French issue, okay? It was this feudal lord against that feudal lord. She's a national heroine. Hello? Uh, uh, I could go on and on and on and on. France wasn't even a nation until the French Revolution. The king ruled over territories he owned by marriage, by this, by that. There were completely different legal systems in Aix-en-Provence and in the north of France. Roman law, Germanic law. I could go on and on. The idea of a nation is a powerful idea. It's an idea that, you know, behind World War, World War I certainly, possibly World War II. Uh, so people believe, but what they believe is often largely false. Um, so I'm no fan of nationalism. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a critic of, if you read my, my book, Palestinian Identity, I deconstruct the whole idea of Palestinian and Israeli nationalism in a, at the very beginning of the book. Um, Israelis are very committed to their nation state. Palestinians have never had one, and so they're committed to it. I think, however, what you say, is, what you say has a lot of, of truth as far as the younger generation is concerned. I think people are realizing that in pursuit of this chimera, this thing that may never occur, they're missing out on the fact that what they could be demanding are equal rights, absolutely equal rights, absolute equality of rights, including presumably equal national rights, but not necessarily within a national context. Now, your two problems are to convince the Palestinians and the Israelis of this. It's fine to say a lot of young people are in favor of this, which is true. I mean, many of my students won't even consider anything but this. And many of the, when I go to Palestine, when I talk to young people, that's all that they, you know, most of them, they're fed up with nationalism. But you have to convince people. And one of the things that I have to fault people who argue for a single state is that they are not thinking of how do you turn these wonderful ideas into political practical formulas? How do you actually get from where we are today to where we would have to be? How would you convince Palestine? How would you convince Israelis? Who's going to convince them? How will that happen? What are the stages? How do you get to that? How do you get from the domination of one nation state, which is the situation that we have a one state solution today. Is that the one state we want? No. It's a state with unequal rights. Some people don't have any rights, some people have limited rights, and some people have all the rights. That's not what we're talking about. You're talking about a single state, if you're talking about a single state, or cantons, or bi-state, or multi-state, whatever it is, where everyone has equal rights. How do you get from here to there? And that's not a theoretical question. That's a political question. That's a practical question. Um, and most of us are not suited for We're academics. You know, we don't, we're not practical. Academics are notoriously not practical. So uh, I have three more questions. Please make them short. This is the last round. So I have here, 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 here. Oh my god, now all the questions are coming up. So we'll take the last round of questions. Okay, but make it short, please. Yes, uh, first of all, thanks for your uh, very good speech. Um, I have a question about President Trump, 
a President Trump's senior advisor and coincidentally um, son-in-law. How do you think Jared Kushner's financial or business background, especially if you consider his contacts and investments in the West Bank, in the settlement, adds to the administration strategy on the Middle East, or in other words, um, do you think that the Trump administration actually has a proper strategy on the Middle East? Thank you. Mm -hmm. and then here, Thank you very much. Uh, th my name is Wassam al Qaisi. I'm from Iraq, and I'm here on my personal capacity. First of all, thank you, Professor, for your instruction, uh, actually, sorry, for your lecture and for your insightful comments. Uh, actually, I just want, I have a remark uh, since Iraq has uh, been brought up within your presentation. Uh, as far as you know, uh, re regarding, I, I liked your introduction because it reminded me of a book that was written by Muhammad Hassan and Haikel in three parts. And in one of these sections, exactly saying what you were saying at your opening remarks. Mm -hmm. Very brief about Iraq. Uh, I guess the shift in the, uh, if you, you touched about the uh, failed states due to the current situation we are facing, mm -hmm. I mean, recently. But um, if, you, if you come back to the, to, to the three wars that Iraq have fought uh, mm -hmm. with the Palestinians, which have never been changed, I believe that the change in the domestic politics or the political systems within Iraq uh, having shifted the Palestinian core from the hearts and minds of the Iraqis. Mm -hmm. Because the Iraqi army back then, if you take it under the monarchy time in 1948, and it was not a republic yet, and Iraq unrested ever since, since 1921 until today, uh, the Palestinian cause was a core, uh, a core, uh, mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't believe it has a, a big effect because, as you mentioned, there is a big social uproar in the Arab world. Uh, and if I'm taking as an Iraq, talking with the individuals, definitely there is a rise up in the opinions about any decision would be taken by any international actor. Very brief, just to conclude, uh, Professor, as well. I want to mention the one of the Security Council resolutions 478, as well as the General Assembly. Resolution 6330, there are many definitely. And the Fourth Geneva Convention, the International Court of Justice in 2004, and its advisory, advisory opinion when they said they both admit it is an occupation territory. And I guess without empowering your opponent, you will never reach into any solution. And that the Palestinian cause would remain uh, as a core cause for individuals, whether in Iraq or the other Arab world. Thank you. Make it a question. OK. Good evening, professor, ladies and gentlemen. I would ask a short question. You just mentioned that at the it's very hard for majority of people to talk against uh, the policy, foreign policy of uh, United States and uh, Saudi Arabia or talking, uh, critiking Arabs. And also, uh, uh, you just talked about uh, the, uh, the uh, voting against uh, the majority of two parties in the United States voted against the recognition of uh, Jerusalem as a uh, capital of uh, Israel and uh, uh, even though the result was like this so uh, President Trump uh, decided for uh, recognition of uh, Jerusalem so uh, how can we uh, how can we translate the democracy in United States mm -hmm. when uh, uh, what is the difference of uh, 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 monarchy government and democratic government which uh, United States is acting uh, a very a role model of democracy in today's world. Uh, what would be your comment? Thank you very much. Thank you. Come on, anyway. um, good evening. Um, this may sound cynical. Um, don't you think that's um, um, well? So actually, uh, don't you think the Arab neighbors wouldn't exploit the um, Palestinian territories, even if Israel? relinquished all the um, Palestinian territories. Um, at the end of the day, this is a geopolitical struggle, and we have seen what happened in Iraq. We have seen what happened in Syria. 
and uh, Palestinians has, have a, a traditional um, grudge against the Hashemite monarchy in Jordan, and Egypt will be happy to extend its territory um, from the Sinai, Sinai Peninsula. And uh, well, Saudis are busy, as that gen gentleman said earlier, is busy um, sponsoring uh, all these um, Wahhabist um, groups. So that would be my question. The next question. I'm sorry, I don't know if you want to ask if I can. This is the easy question. Uh, thank you for your time, Professor. My name is Yassine Kolhuber, uh, American. I, um, my background is petroleum engineering. Mm -hmm. um, you briefly mentioned that the evangelicals were the president's base in the United States, and that a lot of their, you didn't mention it, but a lot of their support for Israel kind of goes behind, let's say, biblical prophecies, mm -hmm. and their belief in, um, let's say, messianic uh, traditions, so they believe this will kind of usher in the second coming of Christ. Mm -hmm. Uh, similarly, the, on the Israeli side, they kind of have some similar uh, messianic traditions, and they believe that these events, for instance, um, uh, moving the capital to Jerusalem will usher in the coming of the Messiah ben David. M my question for you is, how do you think um, uh, fruitful diplomacy can take place when, when um, the people that are, I guess, in part, are part of this conversation they're trying to pave way for the, the anointed one. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Let me answer them in reverse order. Very briefly, um, fortunately, both groups are a minority in those two countries. Evangelical Christians who, as you exactly say, believe that these events will usher in the coming of the Messiah are a small minority, even in the, even in the Republican Party. The problem is they're an energized group and they vote. So the president and, his, and, and the party pay a lot of attention to them, but they are a minority. Um, and, and the same is true in Israel. Religious nationalists believe exactly as you say um, in the religious motivation for their Zionism. They're a minority even in Israel. Uh, the question is why don't people oppose them more vigorously? And that's a, a very good question. In answer to the question which the questioner self-described as cynical, um, it's cynical, but I, 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 with all the due apologies, it's actually also misinformed. First of all, Egypt has repeatedly refused to take over even Gaza um, because they understand that this is not something that they want. Uh, Jordan, while you're, you're absolutely right, uh, Jordan under King Abdullah annexed the West Bank. Uh, the last two kings of Jordan, King Hussein and King Abdullah, have both been very clear in saying we have responsibilities in Jerusalem and that's it. They are not interested in expanding their power uh, to the West Bank. Um, and you're right, um, there may be problems if the, if the Palestinians were to achieve statehood. But I would suggest you, need, you would not only need to look at Arab neighbors. If you look at the destruction of Syria and the destruction of Iraq, uh, it's taken a whole slew of countries to destroy those two countries. Not just Arab countries. Iran, the United States, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Qatar. I could go on and on and on. There are at least eight parties involved in the Syrian civil war. So the civil, Syrian civil war is a Syrian war, and it's a proxy war, a regional war. In some cases, the actual armies. There are Iranian, Hezbollah, uh, uh, Russian, and Turkish troops inside, and American troops inside Syria today. So the people to worry about are not just Arabs. The people to worry about are regional powers, and the people to worry about are also the great powers. There are, excuse me, there are also British and French troops in Syria. Excuse me, you're NATO EU partners. You're not in NATO, but you're in the EU. Um, there was no vote on Jerusalem. I mentioned polling. There was no vote. The polling after the president's decision showed uh, the president is responding to political pressures within his party. The president's party controls both houses of Congress. Uh, and in the Republican Party, the evangelicals have an enormous influence. They're not the majority of Republicans, but they have a lot of influence. Um, what was the last question? Iraq. Yeah, the first question about Trump, Jared Kushner. Um, let me just say that it is true that in a number of Arab countries, there are serious regional or, or internal problems which have very much changed the position of the Palestine issue. Uh, if your country is being destroyed, Iraq, Yemen, Libya, Syria, you can't worry about people somewhere else. This is understandable, reasonable, and correct. Uh, to expect the Syrian people, or the Iraqi people, or the Yemeni people, or the Libyan people, whose countries may no longer exist if the status quo continues, who are being driven into refugee status, or have been driven in 
to have them worry about the Palestinians is outrageous. But the polling I mentioned includes 12 Arab countries. And it shows that in every single one of them, there is considerable support for the Palestinians among public opinion. You have the most undemocratic region in the world in the Middle East. Why is this? Could it be because some of these regimes are externally supported? Could this be because of oil? I don't have answers to those questions. But the fact that this is a region with more monarchies, more jackboot military dictatorships than any region on Earth is something that you should think about when you say the Arabs are not supporting the Palestinians. The Arab governments, which do not represent their people, may not support the Palestinians or may secretly be colluding against the Palestinians. Arab public opinion, even in countries that are suffering, is still not really changed in 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Last question about uh, Trump's advisor, Jared Kushner. Um, and the, the, yeah. Well, I, 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 actually, I actually think that um, when I laid out the, the, the structure of this administration's foreign policy, that what you in effect have is no foreign policy. You have a constant tug of war on every foreign policy issue that starts every morning when the president watches Fox and Friends, which is the morning show on the Fox network. And then he starts to tweet. And then his advisors, like a group of lemmings, have to chase after whatever idea the president came up with while he was sitting there in the bathroom or in his bathrobe or whatever he does in the morning, tweeting and watching Fox and Friends. And that literally has been the pattern for more than a year. So there is no foreign policy. There is whatever the president says and then whatever the semi-sane and more or less establishment figures who are in the administration can do to restrain him. Now, that said, the people he has chosen to deal with Palestine and Israel are the most biased group that has ever existed. Uh, uh, Aaron David Miller, who was one of a very large group that worked on this issue for three decades, described him and his colleagues as Israel's lawyers, critically. These people are beyond being Israel's lawyers. These people represent an extreme fringe of American Zionist and Israeli opinion. Jared Kushner, Jason Greenblatt, and Ambassador Friedman. They're at the far end of a political spectrum in the United States and Israel. And these are the people he's chosen. So he's being pulled on the one hand in this direction. And then on the other hand, there are American interests, which the State Department, the Defense Department, and other people are trying to represent. Uh, on any given morning, who knows who's going to come out on top? Well, thank you very much. Please welcome. Idealism prevails. Make the world a better place.